Really okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to London Metropolitan Archives, uh, both in person and at home as well. My name is Tom. I'm an engagement learning officer here at the Archive. Um, a few bits of housekeeping, and then we'll make a, then we'll make a start. The first thing, housekeeping for those of you who are in person today, is to say that we're not expecting the fire alarm to go off this afternoon. So should the fire alarm go off, we need to leave the building, which we can do by going out of these doors at the back of the room, through the exhibition space, uh, down the main set of stairs, and we'll congregate on the opposite side um, from, from the archive until we're given the all clear to come back in. Uh, and toilets, if you need them, they're just, um, again, out of these doors at the back and they're tucked around the corner, right-hand side on the exhibition space. And some housekeeping for those um, those at home. Hopefully you can see me and hear me okay. I have absolute faith in, in, in Jack, but any problems, do pop that in the, do pop that in the chat. And if it's something our end, we'll obviously do our best to fix that for you as quickly as possible. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of the at the end of the talk, both from um, those who join us in person, those who are joining us at home. Um, but you're welcome if you're at home to put them in the chat as you um, as you go along. Sometimes it can be a bit easier to remember them that way, or you can save them at the end, whichever you whichever you prefer. So before we get into the main the, the main the main bulk of the presentation, let me extend a, a happy new year. And it's probably fading for most of our memories, but this is the first new talk of the year, and all the sort of the cold weather and now the stormy weather, those sort of lovely festive periods seems a distant memory. So happy new year again, and and, and I hope you'll be joining us for one of uh, this the first of many events that we'll be having um, in a, a some new revitalised events program here at London Metropolitan Archives. And I hope you'll come back for more, and those of you who've been here before will, will know what I'm about to say, which is I'm not an expert on what we'll be talking about this afternoon. So I have the very lucky job of being, as I say, an engagement learning officer here at London Metropolitan Archives, and it's my job to know a little bit about a lot. It's, it's my job to match what we have in our collections to what people are interested in, to important things that are going on sort of outside and to, and to sort of special anniversaries and the like. And that's the spirit in which this talk is given. So I've done my research as diligently as possible. As I say, I claim not to be an expert. It's a bit of a nerve wracking one. I've counted at least three people in the room who I might prepare to be called an expert in this. So a little bit, a little bit nerve wracking. Um, so we'll, what we'll say is at the end, we'll have questions, comments, and maybe a few corrections as well. But if I could ask you to hold off questions at the end, that would be, that would be appreciated. And I should say as well, although I'm not an expert, this is a subject that's actually quite close to my cl quite close to my heart. I think my interest in history kind of stems from from sort of a family connection to this this time period, and actually quite close to what we'll be talking about today. So it's quite nice to be here sharing that with you. I couldn't quite say I've enjoyed researching this topic because it's not an enjoyable topic, but it, it's a satisfying one for me to have researched, <coughs> and I hope a satisfying one for me to share with you this afternoon as well. So. 80 years ago puts us in January 1944, and the people of London were feeling the burdens of five years of war. There were shortages of coal, there were shortages of coke, food, other rationing had been in place for quite some, quite some time now. Uh, flu was rife, people were ill, people were at their wits end. The war, the war was unwinnable for Germany at this point, but the end of the war was not yet, was not yet in sight. And this strain showed on people in many different, many different ways. Uh, diarist Molly Panter Downs talks of tired bus, a tired bus conductress who bawl out passengers and shop assistants who snap at customers. An even more dramatic incident on public transport is recorded by the writer uh, James Lee Meal, who describes a physical altercation taking place between a ticket collector and a passenger. He tries to intervene in the altercation only for both women to turn on him and for him need to be rescued by two passing policemen. And to this frustration and this fraught situation, we must add the return of sustained bombing in what became known as the baby blitz or the little bits. Um, and this is the subject of today's, today's talk. The, the little bits, the baby blitz, is diminutive only in comparison to the larger blitz of September, um, to, uh, September 1940 to May 1941 and the V1 and the V2 attacks that would, that would follow. It's, I think it's fair to say a slightly overlooked, not quite forgotten, but certainly overlooked chapter in, in the history of the Second World War in, in, in this country and, and beyond. Indeed, because of the, the, the bigger things, either, either side of it. The, name, the names were sort of almost contemporary. Little Blitz, we think, comes from a Times article uh, in, in March of 19, 1944. And, and the ba Baby Blitz, um, I forget now whether it's Collier O'Brien, but from the official histories that record this, from, from this record, that record this, this period. 
I'm always reluctant to say only when it comes to people being killed and being injured, but the, the, the scale is, if we compare 60, the, the figure we have for civilian war casualties, the accepted figure of people killed in Britain in this country in the Second World War is 60,000, of which 30,000 in, in London. And we have around, again, figures are hard to be precise, 1,500 killed and 2,500 seriously wounded in this, in this campaign. Like all these things, there are slightly fuzzy edges, what counts, what doesn't count. These things aren't as neat as we might assume. But really, we're talking about raids from January to April 1944, around 23 separate, three separate raids. And that, the, the, that's called the Little Blitz, uh, the Little Blitz, the Baby Blitz. And we'll also hit, introduce the term Operation Steinbock a little, a little bit later on. The bombers, though, hadn't been, so we, we talk about this sort of new phase of activity starting in January 1944, but the bombers hadn't been entirely absent from London dur during this period. Um, the sort of the hero heroism, the, the tragedy, the, 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 the danger of the, the what's often called the Blitz, the, ninth, the September 1940 to May 1941 Blitz, is, is, is well known. And after May 1941, the, um, the United Kingdom, the war in the Western Front, sort of fades in, in, sort of fades in attention from, from the Nazi Party, from Hitler, and the, their main sort of military efforts move eastward to the Eastern Front, the Operation Barbarossa, the, the, the war against the, the then Soviet, the Soviet Union. And there were only intermittent attacks in this period, what was known as tip and run raids, or you often hear them more sort of poetically called scolded cat raids. And what these were were often single single plane raids by fighter bombers, so small small aircraft, dropping single bombs on isolated targets, usually coastal targets as well. So the fear of bombing never entirely went away, but very much of a different order um, following um, from the period May 1941 onwards. And there's a, it occurred to me just, just yesterday when I was putting this, putting this talk together and uh, digging out some of the records to show you today, there's actually quite a neat way to um, illustrate this. And that's what you can see on the, on the slide here. So these are one of a, a handful of records that we'll be talking about today. These are fire brigade records um, from the period, contemporary fire board records, and they're bound in volumes. And the volumes are bound in a standard, a standard size. So when you've got enough to fill the volume, you start on the, you start on the, ne on the next volume. Um, so, they eat the, so how much time the volume covers is, is dependent on, on what happened. And you can see where that pink ticket is on the bottom, I hope. That's where we started today. That, that, that's, that's what we dealt with today. So see that pink ticket? So this is the war in terms of recording, in terms of volumes of bombing up until, until this point. And then if you look at the image on the right-hand side, you can see volume 52. It covers September 1951 to January 1944. So I hope this gives you kind of some sense of, in quite physical sense of what is, of what is being dealt with. And it's also a reminder of well, it's quite a macabre fact I've noticed after years of working in archives, that the more death, and destruction and misery there is, the more paperwork that is created. So we will be dealing with the period, as I say, just this, this small period from January to April 19, 1944, and you can see there along that. And even within this small period, the, um, the density of the volumes give us a clue as to the shape of the raids. So the pattern of raids is as, fo is, is we have some relatively minor. Again, I always am loathe to describe anything where people are killed as minor. We have relatively minor raids in January, a concentration of raids in February with a particularly heavy week um, in sort of the third week, the third week of, of February, and then it thins out in March and then April, and then we can see we can see there. And then going back to our kind of our wider sweep of, of the war, we have more volumes for the end of the war because this this shows us the start of the um, the, the flying bomb campaign, the V1 campaign, the V2 campaign, which will start in the summer of 19, 1944. So we might ask ourselves now, why did the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, come, come back with renewed ferocity in January 1944? Well, three things, really. Revenge, personal ambition, and propaganda. So taking a step back, in, 1940, in 1943, we see both the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, and the American Air Force, the United States, the USAF, uh, US, uh, US Army Air Force, the USAF, renew, kind of come to maturity in their, in their attacks on, on the continent, and particularly in Berlin. We see huge raids day, day and night concentrating on uh, civilian and industrial targets in, in, in Germany. 
the, the casualty figures and the, the um, civilian destruction is, is, is massive. In the, the most damaging raids, for example, in Hamburg of this year, we see 45,000 people killed in a, in a single, uh, in a sort of single uh, set of raids. And with, with kind of concomitant destruction to the, 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 the infrastructure of the cities as well. A hugely devastating uh, series, series of attacks that culminate in November 1943, with what's known as the, in sort of military circles as the main phase of the Battle of Berlin. And as that suggests, what we are now seeing is this increasingly mature, this increasingly powerful strategic air forces attacking the German capital. And as the intensity and the damage of these raids in increases, um, Hitler, the Nazis, to a lesser extent, the kind of the German military operation, which is in a kind of complicated world of, of Nazi Germany is both combined and separate with the Nazi party, feel beholden to fight back against, against targets in the West. And that always means London in this, in this calculus. So there's a sense of revenge. There's also a sense of personal ambition. So a figure that many of you will have heard of is, is Hermann Goering, who was the head of the Luftwaffe, the German, the German Air Force. By this point, an increasingly um, um, sidelined figure in the, in the kind of German military war machine, a figurehead only, no real strategic influence on, on the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe only um, really is a conduit of orders from, from, from Hitler. And he's keen to reassert his presence. He's keen to show that the, despite the, the damage that's being done to Germany, he still has something to offer. At the end of the day, it's, if you like, his failure that the bombers are getting, are getting through. So he, he, he decides to take, to take command, influence, to have a revigorated attack against the, the United Kingdom. And then finally, for propaganda. So if the bombers, can't be, uh, the bombers can't be stopped, at least the Nazis can tell the people of, of, of Germany and their occupied territories that they're able to fight back as well. That, as, as, as Joseph Goebbels put it, a deep psychological blow could be inflicted on the Allies, an attempt to turn the, turn, turn the tables. So in order to do this, a force of around 500 bombers was assembled under the respected and capable D Dietrich Pelts. And this became known as Operation, Operation Steinbock. Uh, forgive my German pronunciation there. I've heard various translations of Steinbock. Uh, some simply translate it as Capricorn, others um, as an ibex or a mountain, a, a mountain, a mountain goat. And the, as we heard, this, this, this was an operation for um, propaganda and revenge and designed to perhaps make the Allies think twice about the continuation of these, frankly, horrific raids on the German, on the, um, on the German Reich. And in that sense, it was a failure. As, as we will hear, uh, the raids in a strategic sense, or not in a human sense, affected very little influence on, on Allied war planning. They did little or nothing to disrupt the ever-growing preparation for uh, invasion that would culminate with the D-Day landings of, of um, June 6th, 19, 1944. And if anything, they made their situation worse because at this point in the war, um, the Luftwaffe has scarce resources and to spend them in this way did not match their strategic aims. 500 bombers might sound like a lot, but they were soon, soon rapidly diminished and, and destroyed. In the... Um, course of the next half an hour or so, we'll be drawing quite heavily on some of the records that we hold here at London Metropolitan Archives. It's one of the, um, again, I, I won't say pleasures, but there's something strangely satisfying about being able, and, and meaningful even, about being able to pour over these uh, records. And I would say that this is one of the real charms of archival work, that these records can now be open. Where is it? At the top? It says secret. Well, this isn't 80 years later. This, this isn't secret. These are available for consultation by myself. And this, these records are available for consultation for you as well. So if, this is a, if the stories that we're telling today or other stories throughout, throughout the, the, the talk and throughout the war are of importance to you, I encourage you to order these documents up and consult them on, on your own. You can see the reference number at the bottom, the bottom there. That's all you need and, and a history card. And, the, and for those at home who can't easily come to the archive, there's very many key records from this period are available both on our website through our online catalogue um, and, and London Picture Archive and Layers of London as well. And we'll be signposting to both of those as we, as we go along. So these are the situation reports. They are created at the, at the time 
uh, by, the, by the London County Council. At this point, they are twice, they are twice daily, and they give you something like a real-time sense of these incidents un unfolding. They are partial information, they're updated, they're created, and they will be updated by later scholarship and research and, uh, as well. But there's something, but that I would, they're all the more poignant and valuable for that. That's a, a feature not as bug as it's sometimes, as it's sometimes said. I'm sure you'll have been reading this in, 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 in the background as I've been talking, but if you haven't, let me just draw your attention to the first line uh, where it says, part one, an attack began at 2049 hours and continued until 2159 hours. HE, high explosive, and IB, that's incendiary bombs. And then it goes on to talk about um, where, where they fell and a phosphorus bomb as well. I'm sure many of you will be familiar I uh, will ha and have images in your mind of the, of the, the big blitz of, of 1940, 1941. And of course, one of the, the images that we always associate with that is people sheltering for the whole night for 10 hour raids, for huge tests of endurance by the firefighters, the ARP wardens and all the, the, the civilians and, 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 and rescue workers trying to keep the city alive, keep, keep people alive and just keep themselves sane under very difficult circumstances. In 1940, in 1941, the tactic was to bomb for 10 hours, for the whole, the whole night. Not so anymore. Notice that raid again, 2049 to 2159, roughly an hour, an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. So what's changed? Well, by this point in the war, defences are far, are far improved, um, both in terms of the volume of anti-aircraft fire, but more importantly, night fighters. There was very, very little to no effective night fighters, so I'll, I'll I'm assuming people are familiar with the military jargon, but perhaps I shouldn't. So a bomber is obviously a, a big heavy aircraft that drop bombs, and a fighter, these are the smaller aircraft that attack, attack, attack the bombers. So a night fighter is obviously a fighter that can operate at night. This is an era where radar is just being developed. So if you're flying in the dark, you can't see very well at all, you can't see anything. So in the early phase of the war, finding the bombers to attack was nigh on impossible. There were a few attempts, but it was basically impossible. It was operationally significant, we might say. But by this later period, by 1944, we have better ground radar, and more importantly, we have fast, effective um, fighter, fighter bombers that can house radar on, in the aircraft themselves. And this means, with a lot of other clever stuff going on as well, they can find the bombers over the targets. They can attack the bombers over the targets and they can destroy them. And so now the imperative is to get in in and out as quickly as possible. Hence, this short, these short raiding times. The features of the, the little blitz is these short, sharp raids. And as we'll hear, that has particular human consequences later as well. You might be forgiven for thinking a bomb is a bomb, but sadly not the case. It never fails to um, both amaze and, and sort of despair me, quite about how much ingenuity is put into killing people and breaking things at this and other times in, in our history. And we see a sample of this on, on the board now. So the majority of these records are drawn from National Fire Service records. This is the inside of those black bound volumes we saw a few moments ago. And they give us a sense of the different technologies that are being, that are being used. And they, they're going to give us a sense of how tactics are changing this time, this time around. I'll draw your attention to the top right hand corner uh, where it says enemy flare. Uh, so it says, you, you, you can see the various columns heading to the top. There's a column that says supposed cause and then it says enemy, enemy flare. By this point in, 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 in the war, there's been an attrition of aircraft, there's been an attrition of crews. It's a very skillful job to be able to bomb bomb accurately or somewhat accurately, as accurately as was enabled at the time, to bomb accurately at night, to be able to find Find your city and find target is very difficult indeed. So it was really something only the most expert and skilled pilots could do. And so these pilots were formed into what's called pathfinder divisions. So these are the people that lead the bombing raid. And what they would do, the jargon, they would mark targets. So at, early, at the early phase of the, the war, in the initial blitz, this was done mainly through incendiary bombs. But by this period of time, fl coloured flares were dropped. The flares would be dropped in a particular pattern, which would allow the kind of the vectoring in of the aircraft. The flares are dropped, and then the subsequent aircraft locate the flares, and they bomb in that. So we can see the flares, and then, then the kind of the weapons fall. And this is a combination of incendiary bombs and high explosive bombs. Incendiary bombs are designed to start fires. It, high explosive bombs are what, what we think of as a bomb. The damage comes from the blast, from an explosion. And the combination of the two is the way you destroy a city at this time in history. There are a few extra 
grisly things in the arsenal used at this point as well. So we have modifications on incendiary bombs. It was the incendiary bombs that uh, inflicted a lot of damage in the first in the, in the first splits. But here there are new new variations on a theme. It's hard to read. I apologise. It's the kind of the, the faint paper and ink and ink. But below where we saw our flares, you can see a supposed cause. And here we have S N I uh, I B steel nosed incendiary bombs. One of the problems with the sentry bombs is sometimes they bounce off the roof. When they bounce off the roof, they're less likely to set the building on fire. So if you have a steel nose on the sentry bomb, it will penetrate the roof. It's more likely to set the building alight. And we have explosive incendiary bombs with a delayed seven-minute fuse, which means after they've, if they've, if they've, if they're still not, not fully used um, uh, their fuel, their incendiary fuel, they will, they will explode, causing more damage, also interfering with the ability to fight the fires. And not only are there new sort of types of incendiary bombs, there's new ways to drop them as well. So at the bottom there, in what I think might actually be a film, a, a, a form filled out incorrectly, we can get a bit more information. So it says incendiary bomb container type F. Again, uh, you, might be able to see, you might be able to see, see later on, but it's been scribbled out in pencil and it's been corrected just to I, B, F. But I think actually the, fire, the, the, the person filling this in has given us a bit more information than they were meant to, but it's useful for us looking on. Because here we understand locked individually, they're being dropped as containers from the aircraft, which later disperse the bombs, a way to cause more damage. And even in this case, if the bombs don't ignite, the physical impact of these containers is damaging as well. And then finally, we have on the left hand, on the left -hand side, we can see, um, we'll start at the bottom actually, uh, SDI uh, anti-personnel bomb. So these, these are bombs designed not to target the buildings, but they're designed to target the people clearing up the rubble. So these are shrapnel bombs. And then uh, finally on the top left hand side, another, another kind of grisly fact about the, the, the little blitz or baby blitz was that there were, there were more bigger bombs available for the Luftwaffe. So the size of the biggest bombs was more. But I also include this because I, I feel like in many of these official records, by their very nature, they're sort of they're bureaucratic. They're dealing with difficult things. Kind of the humanity and the personality gets put aside. Of course, it does. But I wonder, night of seventeenth, eighteenth of March, is the person producing this situation report? I wonder if they're at a loose end, and they've just given us a little bit more information. Nothing's happened. No incidents to report, which were called as an item of interest. Blast damage was caused. Queen Mary's Hospital by a thousand kilogram uh, parachute blast bomb uh, near the hospital. No casualties, so there was good news. So a little bit I wonder if someone at a loose end just giving us a little snippet for future. And the parachute bombs were again were a way to maximise the destructive power of any individual weapon. It wasn't just the ordnance dropped by the, um, by the Luftwaffe that you had to worry about, however. You also had to be concerned about, the, um, about what, was, um, what was being done uh, to, to fight it. And here we can see, again, a National Fire Service report. Uh, in supposed cause, we have AA shell. Uh, well, this, this time, that was from, from, from the defenders. So there were um, anti-aircraft batteries in the first blitz, but they were even more concentrated and even more powerful in the, in, the, in the baby blitz. And the idea was that these shells would be uh, fired up from static defences. Hopefully, you'd hit an aircraft, and that does happen. But really, it was to make it so uh, difficult to fly. They had to bomb from higher, less accurately, just cause kind of more distress and, and, and worry. There's not that. It's, it's a lot less planes are shot down than you, might, than you might think in this case. The shells are meant to... Uh, by this point, explode either on proximity or, or on time, but every system fails some of the time. And we do see occasions of, of unexploded shells damaging by their weight and exploding at shells exploding at the wrong time, causing damage, um, causing damage as well. So now we have, I hope, a bit of a sense of the, of, of the context, how London was feeling at, 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 at the time, some of the, some of the considerations, the, the general picture of the raid. And what I'd like to do now for the rest of the time we have here together is we're going to delve in a little bit more detail into three particular, three particular raids um, as I think they explore some of the issues that people faced at the time, the psychology and the, and the hardship uh, that people faced. And they also, I hope, will give, us, give you a sense of, of the way these, this story is recorded in, in our records and how you can access that history if you, if you want to. 
So again, we have two records now that you will be, that you'll be familiar with. This is the situation report on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we have a fire brigade, um, fire brigade report. A little pedantry, though, before we, before, we, before we continue. So at the start of the talk, I used Operation Steinbock, Baby Blitz, Little Blitz, somewhat synonymously. Uh, technically, Operation Steinbock doesn't start until uh, the 21st of, of January. That's the kind of the German operational term. But the whole period we can think of as the Baby Blitz or the Little, or, or the little Blitz. So the raid that we're talking about now is part of the, the Little Bits, Baby Blitz, but not part of Operation, uh, Operation Steinbock. And what we're seeing here, I mean, you'll have, you'll have had a chance. If the pedantry wasn't interesting to you, um, you hopefully now you're starting to have a bit of a picture of what's happened anyway. But let me just take, take, take you through it. So the raid is on the, um, uh, starts on the 14th of January. One thing you have to be a little bit careful of, it takes me a minute, a, a little bit of double checking, is being careful with the dates. So obviously because dates, are, lots of these raids are at night, they will cross over from, you know, the, the evening one day to, to, to night and dusk the next day. So you'll often see the raids described as, so this raid will be described as 14th, 15th, and the situation reports might refer back to the previous night. So notice this is 15th of January, uh, 15th of January, the report at, at 0600 hours. There might be another report at say 2200 hours night previous, but it's referring to the same thing. So just something to bear, bear, in, bear in mind as you work with these documents. Um, and also, this, they will be updated a little bit as they go along. So sometimes you have to kind of keep in your head what raid is being, what incident, to use the jargon term, is being, um, is being referred to. So the incident we, we are talking about now is on, is 14th of January, 1945, 1945 so quarter to eight in the evening. Um, a small number of planes intrude. And one, one plane is over Croydon, where it drops, two, it drops two bombs. And we can see these two bombs recorded, recorded here. So one of the bombs hits the Alders department store in Croydon, which obviously sadly closed a decade or so ago, but for a long time a real um, fixture of the, of, of, of the area. There were two fire watchers present in the, in the building. Neither of them, neither of them were, were hurt. And we can see that recorded, oh, that recorded in this fire service record on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we can see, um, uh, so on the left-hand side, we can see store in Croydon. So that's the Alders department store and cinema as, as well. So this is the Davis, Davis Theatre, um, as it was called, but it's a, a cinema. Uh, it, it, it's a cinema. And this was um, a, a newly opened, a newly opened uh, a cinema, very, very grand, nearly 4,000 seat, uh, 4, seat capacity. And when the bomb fell, uh, when the bomb fell, um, people were in, were in the audience. And so now we might look at this again and be surprised that, again, in quotation marks, that only five people were killed and 33 injured. So thankfully, the bomb didn't explode. We see the bomb penetrate the, the ceiling. Oh, gosh, I'll come to that in a second. We see the bomb penetrate, penetrate the ceiling. The fuse starts, but the, the fuse doesn't ignite the main explosive charge of, of the bomb, and therefore a, a much bigger tragedy was, was averted because we know 1,500 people around about were in the stalls that night. So it probably doesn't quite bear thinking about what would have happened had the, had the bomb actually, actually exploded. One of the really kind of important, interesting things that you can do with researching this and any other topic is start to sort of triangulate on using different, different records, many of which are available online. And even when um, uh, one is sort of, you can't find it on one, you can find it on something else. So this, um, what we can see here is, is a aerial view of uh, London taken between 1945 and 1949, an aerial survey conduct, con conducted by the Royal Air Force following the war. Um, both for rebuilding purposes and, and to survey the damage that was served. And in the middle of this image, um, if you see the road that runs right down the middle, the white road that runs right down the middle, they aren't always the easiest uh, to read. There's a building in the middle, uh, right on the join of the, the two photos join. So one's darker, one's lighter. You see a big building. I could just point, that would be easier. <laughs> this one, this, this one here with the, with the round here. And if you have a close look, or maybe you, you recreate the search at home, you can see the roundel on the building, and that lets us know that it's the, the cinema. A grand art deco building, only opened in the very late 1920s, I want to say. 
Um, so a bomb penetrates the ceiling. People are killed by the impact of the bomb and the, and, and the debris, but a much bigger tragedy is, is, is averted. And um, what's interesting is, is two things. We, firstly, what happened next? So the people are people evacuate in an orderly, in a surprisingly orderly fashion, I, I would say. But a huge crowd gathers, and the crowd is so big that the home guard needs to be called to, um, to manage and eventually, I believe, disperse the, disperse the crowd. And this is something that we see a lot more in the second, uh, in, the, in, this, in the baby blitz than we did in previous blitz. Um, what we might call today rubbernecking, kind of, or, or people kind of coming to see and being attracted by the spectacle of the damage. And historians attribute this to a couple of things. One, what we talked about already, in the first blitz, you were underground or you were sheltering for 10 hours at a time. These raids happen and then they go. But you're awake. It's hard to go back to bed after an air raid. So people kind of come about and they conquer it and they are interested. As well as that, there's a, a comment in lots of the books that people are a bit more cynical perhaps now, a bit, bit more newer to the hardship of war. There's a slightly different energy, you might say, about, about this blitz and people um, are less high-spirited without dragging ourselves into a whole round of historiography about the myth of the, bl myth of the Blitz. There's less high spirits, more of a kind of a world weariness and a spectacle at this time. And the other thing to say as well, uh, and we've got to extrapolate a little bit from this one, is it shows that maybe people are becoming a bit blasé as well. So on, on this particular raid, no siren sounded, so the people in the cinema wouldn't have been warned. But by this point in, in the war, if there was an air raid during a film, a film, uh, um, a film screening—that's not quite the right word—during uh, the performance of a film, um, a warning would flash up on the screen. You would be invited to evacuate if you wanted to, but you didn't have to. You could carry on watching the film, and that, as they say, the risks, the risks on you. And that's something that you see a lot there. So I think it shows again a kind of a slightly different attitude, perhaps, a kind of that, that, that's creeping in at this at this point. And I should say as well um, that this, this, this map, I, I believe, forgive me, I don't believe I said this, this isn't one of our maps. This is, this is uh, on the Layers of London website, which is a fine resource that we contributed to. Um, and it's particularly useful because the map that I'm about to show you, which is also the Layers of London website, <coughs> doesn't come out this far. So, I want, um, so this can be a useful augment to the London County Council bomb damage map, which I'm about to show you on the next slide. So this is the London County Council. Um, this is the London County Council bomb damage map. Um, if you've been to really any of our events that are vaguely map themed or vaguely Second World War themed, you would have seen this before. So, so forgive me, but not everyone has. So let me let me explain this as if it's the first if it's the first time. So these are one of the real jewels in our in, in our collection. There we call them LCC bomb damage maps because they're London London County Council. They're the body that put them together. They're compiled really at, uh, around this time in the war, 1944, but they're kind of constantly, constantly updated. And the colors on the map are a record, the colors on the map are a record of um, the severity of the bomb damage. The darker the, the darker the color, the more severe the damage. So black indicates total destruction, uh, purple indicates um, damage beyond repair, and then the lighter, the lighter colors uh, show us that um, less severe, less severe, less severe damage. Um, I should know this. There are 140 separate, separate, separate sheets, originally from an ordnance survey map produced in 1916, but updated to be more in line with the present, uh, with the present, um, the contemporary uh, period at, at the time. And they were they were compiled by um, by by surveyors. As I say, they are a real jewel in our in our our crown. And if you want more information about them, this is the book to go for. It's in, in our library, but available online. And there's quite a lot of scholarship on them as well. So London County Council Bomb Damage Maps by Lawrence Ward, who is our assistant direct, director here. If you're interested in the Second World War, if you're interested in mapping, if you're interested in local history, these are an invaluable resource to which to, to go. They can be a bit overwhelming at times, I would say, particularly when you see the, the big image of all the sheets stitched to <coughs> excuse me, the big image of all the sheets stitched together. So what we'll do is we'll actually, we'll break this down now to give a bit of a sense of how they might relate to an individual raid. And the, um, the incident, excuse me, I keep on using raid incident to change it, but I shouldn't do that. Incident is the correct, is the correct term. 
so the incident that we're talking about is um, the, the single most um, destructive in terms of hum human life that we have in the, in, in, in the baby blitz, and it became known as the Guinness incident, the Guinness incident, and that's because the main the bombs fell on Guinness Trust housing. So that was a, a charitable trust, a bit like the Peabody, if people are familiar with that, sort of philanthropic housing for the working for the working classes. So the, we are in um, Chelsea in West in West London. Um, and that's the King. That's the King's Road running, the main road running along the middle of the of the image. And as you'll have been able to extrapolate already, we can see the, the dark. Um, the dark images are where the bombs fell. It's likely that the target for this raid wasn't this densely populated area of, of housing, but the power station at the bottom. So if I just just point, it's this sort of big square by the river, with the with a small sort of orange um, uh, orange quarter. Uh, on the top left hand side of it, that's the Lots Road power station. So it's likely that, that was, uh, there was an attempt at precision bombing on that target, but very impossible, very, very difficult with the technology of, of, of the day and the bombs, um, the bombs miss. There's um, a very poignant first hand, first hand account, which you can see, um, this is from our library, the little bits by John, John Cohen, very kind of useful book for this, for this talk. Um, but also in the Guildhall Library, and it'd be available online as well, um, to purchase online, I should say, um, Donald James Wheel has a, a diary of, a, of his account. So they, he was a, a resident at this, at this time. And what the, um, what the Wheels uh, tell us is that they're in their family, they're in their family, their family home on, uh, let me, did I note the exact street? Uh, I didn't know the exact street, but there'll be here on Uberdale Road, I believe it was, but I'm open to correction on that. So they're, they're here. It's a raid, so the anti-aircraft fire has gone. Huge deafening noise has, has, has descended on, on the area. But then between the, um, between the anti-aircraft noise, they start to hear, they start to hear the, the drone of German engines. And then they hear one bomb drop, a second bomb drop. And then they're awaiting the third, knowing that either it will be a near miss or a direct hit. Fortunately for them, not for the people around them, it was a miss. It was a, a, a very, a very near miss. Their their flat is blasted and destroyed, but they're able to they're able to escape. And one of the, I think, very poignant and almost harrowing things that you hear that you hear from this and other accounts, is the significance of the flares that we talked about earlier. So the flares are used to mark the targets, and they talk about not because they had their blackout curtains drawn. They couldn't see the flares. If they'd seen the flares, they would have known it was time to it was time to it was time to go. And you see other accounts as well of people evacuate of, of seeing the flares and then evacuating because they know what the flares are a warning of. So this was the single most um, single biggest loss of loss of life for any raid in the in the Little Blitz. So you always hear different different figures. John Cohen gives it at 84, and that's from the losses of the various um, blocks that were added up. And, I, I, and the, re, the reason, and the reason that the casualties were so uh, was so high was the nature of the accommodation. So you can see, at number one, it's the second, uh, it's the the second incident, but the way they've recorded it is with these numbers to, to give more information at, at the bottom. And as we go along, we see the Guinness Trust buildings, Kings Road, Chelsea occupiers and then business model dwellings. So model dwellings, it's a bit of a term of art at this time, but if you think about the, the sort of four or five story, um, almost barrack-like um, philanthropic or counter housing at this time. So it's densely, densely populated. So when the bomb hits, there's lots of people living there. And a bit like we were talking about with the, um, with the, instant, uh, the instant at the cinema, people have become weary of the war and they're not sheltering always like that like they used to so it is likely the reason the casualties were so high was because the there were shelters uh, sort of on site as as it were but they were unoccupied there was concern that they weren't very nice to be in there was a bit concerned that they would they would they would flood so people stayed in the shelters remember the wheels were in their house at the time with the curtains drawn so they didn't see it and that is why the why the without straying to victim blaming just to understand what happened that is why the casualty for this raid was so was so high on the same night we're also reminded of not just the human cost um, of not just the human cost of, of 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 bombing but the cultural cost as well so the same the same night a different bomber 
again, drops a, a cluster of four bombs. That was a common sort of um, <coughs> configuration of bombs, four 200 kilogram bombs. Uh, falls on the St. James, the St. James area. So just again to orientate you, uh, this is St. James. So the green square in the middle, that's St. James's square. Probably a bit more to familiar to people. If you go south, that's St. James's Park. You can see St. James's Palace right at the bottom there. This is um, this is Green Park on the left-hand side. So that's Piccadilly running along the run, running along the top there. So four bombs fall on this on this area. Four people are killed, I think I should stress that to start with, four, um, uh, four ARP, Air Raid Precaution Wardens, are, are, are killed. We can see again the record here by the National Fire Service. Sorry, Jack, I'm jumping around with the slides. I'm going to go back to you now. Um, but again, um, I want to use this to illustrate the kind of the cultural damage as, as well. So these are high explosive bombs. The damage is caused by is is caused by by blast. Uh, St James's Palace is 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 damaged. I mean, it's minor damage in the scale of things. The but it's of kind of cultural value. The stained glass is blown out. I'm sure many of you, not all of you, are familiar with the the north face of St James's Palace, the clock tower. So the Tudor the Tudor clock tower with the big the big clock on it. The, the clock face is blown off as well. Uh, we don't have them in our collection, but in Westminster um, City Archive have some very fine. Um, photographs of that, which I'm sure you'd be able to locate that very easily. More seriously though, and I, I saw a London Library bag on, on, the, on the way in here, top left hand corner of St James's Square, so about here, is the, is the London Library. Uh, to the, to the, I think I'm right in saying it's the biggest subscription library in, in London, but it's, uh, 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 if you like libraries and books you will know about it, if you, if you don't I should just say it's a, um, a uh, a repository of, of, of many, rare, many, rare, many rare books and periodicals. And it was hit, it was hit on this night a, a, as well. And we have a figure of 16,000 books or periodicals were destroyed on, on, on this night. And I'm going to read you something from their, um, from their website. Because for, for me, the minutiae and the detail of it really brings home the, the poignancy of it. I mean, partly because it's easy for me to relate to, spending a lot of time in, in, a, in a place like this. Um, so like the, the, the librarian at the time, uh, James Pernell, reported, the old periodicals which were on the top floor suffered most damage, especially those with, little, with, with titles beginning with the letters in the second half of the alphabet. There were also heavy losses in biographies with persons with names beginning with the letters G to J and from S to Z. I think there's something about the immediacy of you, particular records, particular shelves being destroyed that's very clear. Also, in the kind of the, the cultural casualties that night, this is St. James then, as now, a, 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 you know, a wealthy upmarket area with lots of art and antique dealers. And a million pounds, um, it, must, it, it must be the money of the day, a million pounds worth of antiques and art treasures were destroyed that night. Um, and spare a thought in all of this for one Mr. Partridge, who was fined 75 pounds by the police for remonstrating with the firemen as they tried to put out, as they, as they doused this building with, um, with water. Why, you might ask? Because in his basement that was now flooded two feet deep, had a series of Rembrandts that he was trying to trying to rescue. <coughs> so we have dwelled in, 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 in the time we've had available to us on some of the worst incidents of, of the war. We've 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 dwelled not unreasonably on the on the on the people that were killed and their and some of their some of their stories. But London is a big city and even when you know the worst things imaginable happening to some people. Other people's lives are going on something like something like normal at the same time, and this is a chance as we start to start to wrap up for me to introduce a couple of other different sources and to give it a sense of what life was like outside of outside of the calamity of bombing. So this is um, from one of the diaries that we have in our collection. A, a man called Anthony Heap who was. Um, uh, a clerk, a clerk in St Pancras at, at the time. Uh, illness meant that he couldn't serve in the in, in the military. But he was, um, as 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 many people were responsible, was part of the civil defence apparatus at the time. Um, I can't quite read the first word, but it, it reads. Uh, I transcribed it earlier in a rare feat of organisation. So it read in read in the evening before going on control duty. Incident as soon as I got to the TH at ten. Sat my post in control room and read through the raid, and read through the raid, which lasted over an hour. No incidents in Barrow to deal with, with no further alert to disturb my night's sleep. 
That's how we, that's how we like it. So we can see, as I say, the, the contrast. And the diary, it's, it's available to order again um, through, through our reference numbers in a kind of easy to read transcript, uh, transcribed form. You, you see that he is concerned about bombing and the war, but lots of his concerns are far more everyday. He says uh, in January 1944 that, he, that um, the relaxation of, um, of um, utility clothing it brings him almost as much joy as um, if peace were declared, because finally he can have turn ups on his trousers again. We also get an insight into uh, the struggles of, of, of clothing at this time and his interest in the like. So he's able to borrow a, a double breasted, uh, excuse me, a single breasted suit of, of someone. It doesn't quite fit, he says, because he's a bit, a bit bigger than he used to be, but it doesn't matter. It's single breasted, so you can wear it open. Again, just a different side of, of, of the war. I also don't want to leave you with the impression. Um, that no one sheltered during the first during this period. Obviously, one of the defining images of the of the early Blitz is people sheltering on the tube and alike. And although there were tragic incidents because people had come inured to the dangers of war, we still see people sheltering. So during the worst periods of the raid in February, 150,000 people took shelter uh, in, in the tube, and people clamoured for better shelters as well. So. We don't have a huge amount of photographs um, from this particular period, but a couple that we do have are on the, are on the screen here. This is the Clapham South Deep, Deep Shelter. So these were built following the initial blitz, not opened. And interestingly, uh, and give an insight into uh, kind of official concerns, into you know, sort of shelter mentality, not opened during the baby blitz, but opened um, to um, offer people protection against the, um, the V1 and V2 rockets that would come in, in the summer. And this is from our main photograph collection. And then finally, another incident that was um, kind of weighing heavily, well, another aspect of life that was weighing heavily on Londoners and gives us a sense of, of how else we can approach the topic is alluded to, and it is only alluded to in this, this, um, this short history of the London County Council produced just after, just after the war. So it's all worth a read, but I draw your attention to the council and housing. Uh, about 2,000 flats and 500 cottages were completed by the council during the first year of the war, but, but, work, excuse me, but work on new houses and flats practically ceased when the air raids began. So the destruction of London's housing stock was a, was a, was a, a big problem for people. And as the war went on, people became, um, um, more and more people came back to London after the early evacuation. Despite the horrors we've just talked about, people have predicted a, a, almost an apocalyptic level of damage at the start of the war, and that never materialised. People are coming back to London, but there are less houses. They've been destroyed. Houses that have been damaged are suffering an epidemic of dry rot because buildings are left open to the, uh, left into the elements. There's, there's flood water everywhere, burst water mains are light by damage, so dry rot is a big problem at this time as well. And there's a reluctance and a, and a difficulty in repairing housing stock. Um, partly there's a shortage of men and materials, as you would expect, but people are reluctant to rebuild because you might rebuild. In, uh, there's an example in December 1943, Islington repairs nearly 1,200, uh, 12,000, excuse me, 12,000 windows in the borough, and then the baby blitz starts and they're blown up and they're blown up again. So people are holding back repairs until until the um, until the war is well and truly well and truly over. Um, and then you can see just the bottom there. By the end of the war, shortage of houses was one of the biggest problems the council had to face. And if you're interested in the story of the Second World War, I actually think that story of housing and reconstruction, also kind of very well told in our archives, is an important one to follow up as well. But um, at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention. So, so far, what isn't an easy topic and actually quite technical records as well, um, and hand over, as I say, for, for comments, questions, and of course, corrections as well. So uh, over to you.